Hello everyone and welcome back. In this session, we are going to be properly introduced to the lexical analyzer. So, let's get to learning. Coming to the outcome of this session, today we will learn the working principle of lexical analyzer in details. Now in the session, different phases of compiler we observed, when we gave this arithmetic expression to the lexical analysis phase, the lexical analyzer produced a stream of tokens. And we also came to know that the lexical analyzer uses regular expressions for recognizing the tokens. Basically, it uses the regular grammar or type 3 grammar for recognizing the tokens. So, if we are to note down the features of lexical analyzer successively, well, it scans the pure high level language code line by line, and while doing so, it takes the lexemes as inputs and as outputs it produces the tokens. Now coming to tokens, there are several types of it. It may be an identifier, an operator, constants. Basically, these are the fixed values which we assign to the variables in the source code itself. Then there is keyword, that is various keywords of the programming language. If we consider C programming language, if, int, return, etc. are the keywords of that. Tokens can also be literals, that is string literals. The punctuators like comma, semicolons, parentheses, braces, brackets, etc. are also tokens. Finally, the spatial characters like ampersand, underscore, etc. are tokens as well. So tokens can be broadly classified into these seven categories. Now in a lexical analyzer, two functions take place. First, the scanning and then analyzing. Lexems are given to the scanning phase which in turn eliminates the non-token elements such as commons, consecutive white spaces, etc. Thereafter, in the analyzing phase, the actual magic happens and we get the tokens at the end of that. Let me illustrate how this analyzing phase works. Let's consider a few tokens of the C language. Now, if is a keyword of C and that's why it is a token. Now for recognizing F, the lexical analyzer will require a finite state machine or FSM. So from the initial state A, seeing I, we will move to the next state B. Then from B, seeing F, we will end up in the final state C. Considering identifiers, well, we already have briefly observed the finite state machine for that previously. So, from the initial state, say D, seeing a symbol, may that be any small letter in the range of A to Z, or any capital one in the same range, or an underscore, we will end up in the final state E. Because we know that single letter can also be an identifier. Like for most programmers, the variable that runs any loop by incrementing itself is i. Additionally, an identifier can have any number of letters, underscores, or digits. Nonetheless, they must follow either a letter or an underscore. Now, if we talk about integers, for an integer starting from the initial state, say f, if we see any sign, be that a positive or a negative sign, we will move to the next state G. And from there, seeing any digit from the range 0 to 9, we will end up in the final state H. Now this much is sufficient for single digit integers. However, for two or more digits, we will have an epsilon transition from this final state H to G. That is, from H, without seeing anything, we can move to G. Now using this portion, we can have any number of digits. By the way, integers can also not have any sign at the beginning because for positive integers, the positive sign is implied. So we need not mention that. Therefore, to facilitate that property, we will have an epsilon transition from the initial state F to this state G. Now, these are individual finite state machines with their own initial states. In the analyzing phase of the lexical analyzer, we cannot have separate finite state machines. 
it will need a single finite state machine combining all the separate finite state machines. Assuming our C language has only these three finite state machines and can only recognize the keyword if, identifiers and integers, let me show you how these will be combined as a single finite state machine. So, what we will do, we will introduce a new initial state, say S, and we will have epsilon transitions from that to all these different states. Now, this one is an NFA or non deterministic finite automata. To be precise, it actually is an epsilon NFA. Epsilon NFA is the NFA which contains epsilon moves. Moreover, NFA is conceptual, that is, we cannot implement it. For implementation, we will have to derive the equivalent deterministic finite automata or the DFA. Now, this one here. This is the equivalent DFA. It will recognize the keyword if the identifiers, also the integers. Let me show you how. Starting from the initial state S, seeing the letter small i, we will move to the state 1. And from there, seeing F, we will move to the state 2. And since it is a final state, if we stop here, it will mean that this DFA has recognized the input lexem as the keyword token if. Now, if the lexem has got something more than if, suppose it is ifFY, in that case, we won't stop at the state 2. With the first f after if, we will move to the state 3. And then, for the last y, we will use this self loop and remain in this state only. Now, the question is, why 1 is also a final state? If you remember, earlier in this session I told you that the identifier using which most programmers run loops is i. So, if we see i only, which doesn't have any following f, then it is not a keyword. Rather, it is an identifier. So, for the DFA, if it stops reaching the state 1, it recognizes that as an identifier. Now, observe the transition from 1 to 3. Here, we have intentionally chosen the range of small letters a to e or g to z. So, after i, except small f, if we have any other small letter or any capital letter or an underscore or any digit, we will move to the state 3. Now, observe this transition here. If you observe the ranges of small letters a to h or j to z, that is, any small letter except i. So, from the initial state s, seeing any small letter except i or any capital letter or an underscore, we can move to this final state 3. So, if the machine either stops in 1 or in 3 through any of these transitions, it will recognize the lexem as identifier. Now, coming to the lower portion of the DFA, starting from the initial state, seeing a digit from the range 0 to 9, we can end up at the final state 4, which will recognize any single digit positive integer. Thereafter, this self loop on this state 4, it will help the DFA to recognize any other positive integer with two or more digits. Now, if in the lexem the sign has explicitly been specified for those starting from the initial state, saying any sign, be that either positive or negative, the DFA will move to the next state, that is, this state 5. And from this, seeing a single digit, it will move to the final state 4. Then again, the self loop of 4 will help the DFA to recognize the signed integers with two or more digits. So basically, starting from the initial state, if the DFA ends up at the final state 4, it will recognize the token as an integer. In a nutshell, the final state 2 recognizes the keyword if, final states 1 and 3 recognize identifiers, and 4 recognizes integers. And DFAs like this are implemented within the analyzing phase of the lexical analyzer. So we can state 
The lexical analyzer takes lexemes as input and produces tokens, and while doing so, it makes use of the DFA for pattern matching. Now, to be honest, I have illustrated the working principle of the DFA, but I haven't shown how we can construct DFAs. So, for that, the learners need to have the concepts of NFA, that is non deterministic finite automata. Thereafter, the procedure of conversion from NFA to the deterministic finite automata or DFA. And finally, the knowledge of minimization of DFA to the minimized DFA or MDFA is also required. These all can be learned from our beautifully presented theory of computation course. So it's my strong recommendation to all of you that please go to that playlist and kindly learn these all from there. Now, if you remember, we were noting down the features of the lexical analyzer, right? Let's continue that. Now, apart from these two, the lexical analyzer also removes comments and white spaces from the pure high level language code. In C, two types of comments are there single line comments and multi line comments. While scanning, the lexical analyzer detects comments. If it encounters double slash, it ignores the rest until a new line. And if it encounters slash star, everything afterwards will be ignored until a star slash bin scanned. Using these patterns, the lexical analyzer classifies the comments as non token elements and eliminates those. Consider this statement. Here we have the keyword int, which specifies the data type. Then we have this comment in between Nestle. After going through the scanning phase of the lexical analyzer, the comment will be removed. However, a blank white space will be placed in place of the comment. Now, during semantic analysis, an error will be generated. There, SO will be reported as an undeclared variable. However, for lexical analyzer, NE and SO will be two different tokens. Now coming to white spaces, these are of several types. The space, which is inserted in the source code using the spacebar key. Then the horizontal tab, which can be inserted using the tab key. Then the new line. Now vertical tab is six times the new line. Thereafter the form feed, which is a page breaking ASCII character. And finally, the carriage return, that is the space created by the enter key of the keyboard. All these white spaces are non token elements, which are recognized and eliminated by the scanning phase of the lexical analyzer. Now, along with these, the lexical analyzer also helps in macro expansion in the pure high level language code. Basically, it allocates the value specified by the macro in the hash defined preprocessor directive to all the instances where the macro has been used in the code. Now we already know after the pure high level language code has been given to the lexical analyzer, it creates the entries for the identifiers in the symbol table. Along with that, it produces tokens and hands those over to the syntax analyzer. Now, this doesn't happen at once. After one token is passed to the syntax analyzer, the syntax analyzer performs parsing and during that, it asks for the next token to the lexical analyzer. And in response to that, it provides the next token to the syntax analyzer. So, the lexical analyzer and the syntax analyzer frequently communicate with one another. So, this is how the lexical analyzer works. So, in today's session, we learned about the working principle of the lexical analyzer in details. Alright people, that will be all for this session. I hope the working principle of lexical analyzer is clear to you now. In the next session, we will observe the tokenization of lexical analyzer. So, I hope to see you in the next one. Thank you all for watching.